Hey everybody, it's Thursday, October 17th. I'm David Ruddick, and it's my pleasure to uh, introduce you to our guest, Tech Media Maverick, who's written for everyone, including Engadget, Android Central, and who's also writing for us, as well as Geekspin. She's the host of the Mobile Tech Podcast as well, Miriam Joar. Yay. Thanks for having me, David. Thank you for coming on. Um, you know, this is the, we've really started doing, you know, a lot more guests and interviews on the podcast in the last couple of weeks. We're doing some new stuff with the show and uh, you were definitely high on our list of guests to have on. Well, I'm glad. Uh, I'm actually joining the chat right now. So just hang tight. Um, and uh, I actually created a Twitch account for that. So fantastic um no, to crazy. our to those of you joining us live on twitch um you know be feel free feel free to drop questions in the chat as we go and we will try to answer those um near the end of the show but this week obviously you know we we've already had one show about the google uh, event on tuesday which uh, both miriam and i were at but i think everybody probably who listens to this podcast isn't ready to be done talking about that event yet um i'm certainly not um especially given you know i've got the google pixel 4 xl in hand i've been using it and everything um and i've definitely got some thoughts i'm not allowed to give you all of them it's it's actually kind of unclear the thoughts i'm allowed to give you yeah i was gonna say what i was allowed to not talk about and talk about i can we just say i don't like this feature and i like this feature or what i, I apparently activated the, i said the word um on that phone and it activated the hot word <laughs> um so i i we're just not allowed to quote review the phone and i i guess compare things i don't even know if i'm allowed to talk about what we're not allowed to talk about but i'm just telling you so if you guys have questions and you're like oh well why didn't they talk about this or for example like battery life or like the new super zoom future feature or how well the face thing works like you know basically we're not allowed to be in depth about things right now but we can give you kind of an overview of everything so far and i i think you know both of us probably got a pretty good sense of the phone from using inside the demo area alone you know that was yep. that was a fair amount of time i mean google had that demo area open for like three hours i think it was a long time so what were your first thoughts miriam i know you always come across with a, an opinion just about as fast as i do yeah, you and I are like like two knights on shiny horses, you know, with opinions <laughs> pewing out of us with laser beams. Uh, I think it's, I have a lot of, uh, I'm feeling very torn and, and churny inside my belly because of this phone. It's like so many things are right, yet so many things are wrong. And once again, the world is a mixture of right and wrong. And why can't we just have everything right with our Pixel 4s, you know? That's kind of how I feel in general. Yeah, I think there are definitely some compromises that have been made with this phone. And we discussed that on the show uh, when we broadcast from New York very sleepily on um, the night of the press conference. But after using it a little more, I think I've you know personally had a chance to just kind of understand more of you know the things that I think are going to be divisive about this phone. And Google's products always are. Divisive may as well be the first bullet point in anything Google announces. That's kind of their their MO at this point. And I think number one is, you know, I think battery life is going to be a big concern with both these phones. Um, yeah. And I, th I think that also the face unlock is going to be divisive just because everybody, you know, wants seems to want to keep their fingerprint scanner. Not me, but Can a I lot just of chime in on that right now. Literally yeah, this moment, absolutely. I just picked up the phone off my Pixel stand. It's charging right now from its first setup. And I went to point it at me. And as you can see, I have a mic in front of me with a pop filter and I have headphones on. And right now it is not recognizing me whatsoever. The only way I can unlock this phone right now, if this was my main phone, is to slide up and enter my code. And that, I folks, is already pissing me off big time. Yeah, I mean, if you use the iPhone, you know, there's similar situations of frustration. I've been using the iPhone 11 Pro Max, and I guess I can talk about the experience of using the Pro Max Face ID in terms, let's call it a stand-in for the Pixel 4. <laughs> and in terms of, like, why this technology is something I personally like, but sometimes can be frustrating. Uh, the most frustrating use case, without beyond a shadow of a doubt, we all use our phones in our cars sometimes. Let's just be realistic. Maybe some of you are perfect out there, and good for you but I'm a person who I'm stuck at a red light in traffic. I'm going to be sitting there for two minutes. I'm pulling out my phone. Sorry to Plus, say it. Plus, <laughs> Ruddock and I are professional car racers, so that's fine. We, we can handle this. But the problem is a lot of times you get a lot of glare and reflections inside your car because of the windows. And, you know, when it's sunny out, like Face ID can have trouble. I will say the newest uh, generation of it is a lot better than the original iPhone X was. The iPhone X was very not good in the bright sun. 
Um, it's but then, ten, David. Ten. I call it the X, and I refuse to call I know, it anything I'm else. Just, I'm just bugging you. <laughs> but that's one situation where I think Face ID, you know, does uh, does have a downside. The upshot, though, is any situation where your hands are wet or dirty, or you really don't want to touch your phone too much, Face ID is a much better biometric system. It works yeah, really yeah. well in those situations. Or if you're wearing gloves, for example, um, there are situations where it can work really well. And I think people, when they buy the Pixel 4 and they start using it, they'll realize, yes, face authentication comes with drawbacks, but it does I mean, have benefits. Look, I mean, I'm just saying that I've had an iPhone X, sorry, for two years now, and I use it from time to time, and I've never had this issue when I'm wearing my headphones of it not recognizing me. Like, I'm, I'm actually clearing the mic right now, and it's still not recognizing me. Interesting. So that's did a you, major uh, fail. Did you install the OTA update out of the box? Uh, it's just, it, it just rebooted from that OTA, so I think... Uh, oh, that's because I mean, you, have already unlocked, you have but... to re-unroll your face. Oh, you do? Look at that. <laughs> yeah. uh, yeah. There's so a that's notification. why it's not working. Okay, <laughs> so well, then I will, I will shut up. Um, yeah, but that, that's that's the thing for me. That's going to be the key thing. I I honestly think that Face ID is great. Like I and you know what Apple's shown us and has improved on, and I think that the Pixel Four is further improving upon that. I think is is the future. There's no doubt. But I also feel like you know I've talked about this with Rene Ritchie at iMore. I really feel that the future of you know like near near future of mobile phones is. Um, you know, half the display or half of the back or some large surface area that you easily often touch with either your index or thumb or one of your fingertips uh, be a sensor in addition to having face recognition. And together they create a probability model of who that is touching the phone and looking at the phone. And based on that, they unlock, you know what I'm saying? And, and this would require machine learning. This would require a lot of the technology we have today. But I think until we have that, that um, and, and possibly Apple will perfect it first because they are always kind of at the bleeding edge of this stuff. Um, I think we're going to be in this weird place where some people are going to be missing their rear fingerprint scanner, good old capacitive, you know, like we've had on all the pixels so far. And then some people are going to be missing, you know, if they, uh, if they go to another phone, missing the face ID. And it's just the way it's going to be, right? Yeah, I think so. Manufacturers are going to make a choice about it. And I think the lines are largely drawn. There are rumors, of course, um, from, what is it, Ming-Ko, Ming-Cho, um, Ming-Ko, Ming-Ko, um, that Apple will switch, or not switch, but will add a in-screen fingerprint scanner to iPhones in future generations, Ming-Chi-Ko. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> um, so, but my, my guess there, you know, Miriam, you've probably seen these prototypes as well or at least read about them you know these prototype phones where half the screen or the whole screen is right that's what i'm talking about right like yeah. so i think honestly the front of the phone to me is the candidate for face id like three-dimensional proper depth based you know like what the i think that's the other thing we should talk about i think the audience here knows this but just to reinforce it like you have face id on a lot of phones you can buy a moto g7 and get face id okay but it's camera based. It's two dimensional. That it's not secure. You cannot make Google Pay purchases with it. This is the first Android phone in the entire universe that lets you do Google Pay with Face ID. The Pixel. Yes, phone, and so and also to be clear, it's not the first one that uses a dot projected Correct. IR mate. Mate twenty Pro did it, and the Oppo Find X did it. They were the only two so far that did it, as yeah. far as I'm aware. Um, I believe there's a Xiaomi phone. I believe the Mi Nine Pro. Did this um, came one out? Of the, the Expl no, the Explorer Edition Ooh, one. Okay. Um, I think that one had a dot projected IR face unlock as well, but none of these phones were able to leverage that into uh, the secure biometric model because it wasn't supported in the version of Android that they ran. Right. So Google now has defined that, and as maybe some of these phones will get updated to Android 10 and will be able to you know submit their authentication system and make it work. Um, but for now, the Google Pixel 4 is the only phone that can do this. Right. And so I think what I was trying to get to with this is that basically, you know, you have to be aware that this is a very secure type of face ID versus what we have. So, right. So I think that to me, the front should be face, but the back of the phone is the ideal candidate for a large surface. It doesn't have to be the entire surface, but a large surface uh, detecting maybe your index finger. Right. So that way you can just hold your phone. And then, or maybe the edges of the phone would be a good candidate for the biometric finger stuff. 
And then, you know, you get this multiple authentication. That's, I think, where we should be headed. Multiple authentication sounds great, definitely. I think the back of the phone would pose a lot of challenges given NFC and wireless charging starting to proliferate again. So I would wonder how the signal for fingerprint scanners would be able to like work with those technologies. But I think the idea with the side of the phone is very cool. I also think the other thing manufacturers are looking at, like we've seen demos of phones that have full screen fingerprint scanners. The issue is cost. These things, if you want to really cover a phone in these very sensitive fairly complicated sensors it, it costs a lot of money right now yeah, obviously you yeah. know economies of scale eventually could make it workable so david what's your take on uh me and dave and daniel sorry daniel bader of android central was on my podcast yesterday morning that podcast should be out this weekend and we he told me something that blew my mind and it's going to prevent me from making the pixel 4 my main daily driver like i do with all pixels as soon as they come out and it's that a lot of apps are going to have to be updated to be able to authenticate using this system. So my, you know, banking apps, my even my Tesla app that uses fingerprint for changing settings, the critical settings, will need to be recompiled or rewritten or whatever to use this system, this new API. And I cannot make this for my main phone. Like I have too many mission critical fingerprint based authenticated apps on my current Pixel 3 XL. So this is pissing me off as well. Yeah, exactly. So I've had this problem as well in my review unit. Um, so what we're seeing here, uh, Michal uh, from XDA explained this a little bit on Twitter in response to a thread I did about it. But the whole issue here is that Android 10 has this, or Android 9 had a new API to target for biometrics. Android 10 has the final version of that API. And the idea is whether you have a fingerprint scanner or a secure face unlock method or some other biometric you know, authentication method that like an iris scanner, perhaps, all of those can live under that biometric a manager API. And any app that targets that API, it doesn't matter. Like it doesn't matter what kind of uh, biometric authentication you're using as long as it meets requirements and it's under that API, it'll just send you to that. Um, the problem is a lot of apps are still targeting an older fingerprint API in Android. And these apps need to be updated. Now, the issue, the, the crux of that is Google is requiring that apps be updated to target an API level consistent with that as of November 1st. Are all apps going to do that? No. Is Google going to remove apps that don't do it? No. But there is some impetus there. And this happened, I was talking, um, who was I talking with about this? But I forget. I think we were talking about it on the show. Um, honestly, I don't barely remember that show from Tuesday night. I was so tired. We were talking about how when the original Pixel came out, it had a fingerprint scanner and it was shipped with a version of Android that was one of the first to have secure biometric as a third party API. And it took ages for app developers to support that just for a fingerprint scanner. Rather than just unlocking your phone, you could use it as a secure, a secure unlock method for apps that contain sensitive data. So it took a little while. Hopefully this one won't take nearly as long because it's a much more trivial change developers need to make, um, comparatively at least. But, you know, we're talking about developers who are traditionally super conservative and take forever to update their apps because, you know, security, right? Like banks, like, trust me, this is going to be a nightmare for a lot of us, David. This is going to be bad. It's going to be a bit I, of a pain. I basically don't expect to be able to make the my, the four, my, my picks, my, my fully, my daily driver until probably about January at this point. This is my goal. But, you know. I, I can't just carry another phone with me with just my banking stuff on it. It's just ridiculous. Yeah, um, I don't know. It I, I can't affect, believe they didn't think of that. It doesn't affect, I mean, I'm sure they thought of it. I, it doesn't affect me as much. There are a few apps I rely on reasonably frequently that need it, but a lot of them can just use pins instead, and I just don't care enough. Yeah, I mean, it's so. just, I mean, obviously there's Google Autocomplete, right, which is great, but I just, like, I don't want to really do Autocomplete with banks, you know? It's just like, come on. It's a little security hazard, in my opinion. But hey, uh, we'll see. I mean, that's that's the big thing right now that I kind of stunned me when I talked to Daniel yesterday on the show, on my show. Um, but uh, I don't know if you want to uh, move on to other things. If you're done with fingerprints and face ID, my, my big gripe, and, and I want to start with the gripes so we can talk about the positives, right? Because get the bad stuff first. My big gripe, honestly, is the pricing and the base RAM, well, the only RAM and the base storage. Um, and the lack of wide angle, ultra wide. These four things to me um, do not make sense when you consider where Google's what Google's position is in the market. And I need the 
I think they need to like I feel that they're trying to be like Apple and do their own thing and or operate in a vacuum and hope things stick. In some ways, they're doing smart things with like it's available on all carriers now, the Pixel Four and Four XL in the U.S. That's great stuff. But like you can't operate in a vacuum when the rest of the mobile you know smartphone world exists google like get your s together i don't know if i can swear on the show but yeah it's fine you know get your shit together it's like this is you know you this phone as it is today with 6 gigs of ram and a base price of a base level of 64 gigs of ram should be 599 you know or you know just 100 dollars less or 200 dollars less at least 599 for the small one 699 for the big one that's what i would have priced it at now if you add the stuff that i want 8 gigs of ram base storage 128 gigs and put an ultra wide in there Regardless of all the talk around, and we'll talk about the camera, regardless of the fact, yeah, do we need an ultra wide, all this, blah, blah, blah. Regardless of that, that's what the spec should be. And then then you can price it $799 and $899. And that's, that's, I think that's real. That's, that's, the, that's the reality today. So I think this is a good discussion to have about pricing because we did an article yesterday talking about uh, trade-in values for Google's uh, Pixel oh, phones. I saw your tweets about that. <laughs> that um, so what Google is doing and has done, we always know this happens with Google's Pixel phones. They start out very expensive and then they become cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper in various sales over time. And they're very rarely permanently discounted, but there's as long as you're willing to wait, there's always a chance to get one for a significant discount. Well, Google really showed us yesterday, once again, what that's done to the resale value of their own smartphones, which is it has absolutely decimated them. So Google is willing to give you $260 on trade-in for a base model Pixel 3 XL in fully working condition. No screen cracks, no significant damage, charges everything, no water damage, etc. cetera. Um, they're willing to give you, I believe, nearly, uh, I think it's basically twice as much for an iPhone XS Max, <laughs> which is, you know, supposed to be a comparable smartphone. And that just shows that Google's strategy of just constantly undercutting the pricing because they felt the phone wasn't selling well, devalued them in the resale ecosystem heavily. Now, Google isn't the only phone manufacturer that does this. We all know that. Samsung does right. this themselves constantly. But Samsung does it because they operate at such a scale that they can afford to. Samsung's, you know, Samsung's galaxy brain when it comes to selling smartphones. Google really needs to be focused here on planet Earth um, in terms of where they're really targeting and their pricing and everything. And my thing is, you're right. Google, if they're going to give phones these specifications, and we know what the bill of materials on these phones are, they need to be cheaper out of the gate. If Google is going to knock off $200 off the small phone three months from now, that's that's a problem. That just shows that you are overpricing your product. You're making it too expensive. And consumers will understandably flock to it the first time you discount it. Yeah. So I think that this is the... Uh, this is an issue for Google and one that they didn't address. They've Instead, they've chosen to put on blinders and decide that Apple is their point of comparison. Apple is what they're going to price against. Everybody else doesn't matter. You know, the only thing, specs don't matter because Apple doesn't care about specs. No, that's, that's not true. Look, Apple does care about specs. Apple gave us, and this kind of stunned me when it did, when it happened. Apple gave us three cameras this year on the Pro, but when they gave us two cameras on the 11 base, I honestly totally thought they would just carry over the cameras from the x uh the 10s the xs whatever you want to call it uh, last year and just call it a day because it would be totally uh, totally an apple thing to do right go for the cheap thing you already have the suppliers you already have the part just just incorporate it into a new sh chassis put the new chip in there and you know last year's display and you're done right that's not what they did they went with the ultra wide as the second camera which we all know is the only thing you should do if you have two cameras it's nah, telephoto is better. I don't come on. <laughs> yep, telephoto. I'm 100% telephoto. Cam. Are you serious? Yeah, 100%. I, those, I, I honestly you? almost never use the wide That's angle. It. I love telephoto. You can telephoto. never talk again, David. <sighs> come on. You, you, who doesn't want to get closer to stuff with a camera? That to me is like, no, the, like one of the camera's no, best purposes. No, no, you can always walk closer. Well, you can't always. But the point is, you can't. It's really hard for you. And, and I, I think that if you're going to have two, I think you should have one tried. But it's just me. And so I'm, I'm, really pissed off about the lack of ultra on this. Like this is really, at that price especially, I'm like, if it was cheaper, I'd be like, okay, fine. But it's not cheaper. It's an expensive phone. I'm just pointing this way because the phone's charging that way. Um, it, it's just like, oh, come on, Google. Why? Like last year you made a phone with a single camera. You were one year behind. 
This year, you made basically an iPhone XS in terms of camera, okay? Like, sure, the software is a whole different thing, and we can talk about that. And that's one of the big pros, right? And I'm hoping that it's better than the iPhone 11 now. Uh, because I'm, you know, I'm an Android user. I want Android to, I want Google to win this one, this battle. But uh, I'm frustrated so hard by this lack of wide angle at that price. I want well, you know, it's, it's, and it's, it's a stack of things. It's the wide angle. It's, I, I'm not one to scream about RAM, but given what, Google's competitors are doing it's like guys you know if you're not there Google pretends there are no benchmarks that's the thing Google pretends that there is nobody else they have to compare to but Apple that's to me one of their biggest failings in their pixel division because they've said from the beginning they're not targeting other Android phone users they're targeting iPhone users and peeling away from that crowd is it's a tall order you're working against such bigger things than specifications or you know just brand loyalty brand loyalty is a huge part of it you're also working against ecosystem lock-in that's incredibly hard to break and i think that google just focused on that market is is ill-advised it is and i mean i mean especially when the iphone 11 pro which costs you know what a little hundred dollars less than the Excel. So maybe should we compare the Excel to the 11 or should we compare the or the the four in general, the four line up to the 11 or the 11 Pro? Because the 11 Pro is a whole dimension of price more. But if you look at it versus the Pro and if they're comparing themselves with that, they're missing a camera. Hello? Like they're just yeah. missing a camera. They're missing a camera. How iPhone you, users are going to come to your phone if you're missing a camera? If Apple gives them a phone with three cameras and you're giving them a phone with two cameras, F you. Okay, like go home. Okay, you're done. Yeah, and it's also just, you know, kind of the whole thing with Apple has an actual ecosystem to offer their customers. Mm -hmm. They Android and Google really don't. They, you know, Google would like to say they do, but well, in reality, ecosystem, which you got to say is pretty freaking brilliant. It is. I mean, I've been using the Apple Watch for a few weeks now and completely understand the lock and desired. Apple Watch is a fantastic product. Really, really good. And it just is one of the another one of those things. Well, you buy a Pixel. What smartwatch do you use? Well, <laughs> oh, they're all Galaxy pretty... Active 2, of course. Yeah, that's the least terrible of them exactly, all, yeah. basically. And that's <laughs> that really is the truth, though. Least terrible is the best way to describe Samsung's wearables. So yeah, yeah. I think Google is is fighting such an uphill battle, and they're doing so while pretending that they can charge nearly what Apple does for their phones. And I think that's living in a fantasy world. And I think that's it's important to separate out that discussion from the phone as a product. How good is the phone versus what is Google's whole approach here? Like, yes. how do they want this to work as a business? And right. I don't see anything they changed this year that makes the Pixel work more as a business. And it's exactly where I was going with the pricing. And and of course, also want to remind everyone, we do not live in the vacuum, right? I want to remind everyone, you can buy a Xiaomi Mi 9T or well, yeah, Mi 9T Pro, whatever it is, the Snapdragon 855 based $350, $400 phone that, yes, it's not going to have Android 10 for a while. It's not going to have the Google experience of the Pixel in terms of this, you know, the UI. But put a launcher on there, put a keyboard on there. And honestly, for $400, you have a phone that, you know, has kick ass specs, has eight gigs of RAM. Hello, at $400. I mean, like, come on. Like where are like you can't like we are living in a world right now where there is such a breadth of Android phones you can't ignore that breadth even if there are shortcomings in that breadth you know what I'm saying? Absolutely, there are just so many phones out there now, and China has really shown, really pushed through commoditization of smartphones in a way where for years it was always well Chinese phones yes they're cheap yes they have the specs but on paper kind of crappy exactly you know? and it's just but not now true anymore no longer kind of crappy I mean and even you know, forget Xiaomi for a second because that's an imported phone let's look at the OnePlus 7T okay a phone you yeah. can buy from T-Mobile a phone that costs $599 a phone that at $599 has three cameras in the back has a 90 hertz display that's always on has a bigger battery you know, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And if you put the G-Cam on that phone, you're getting much better photos than one OnePlus provides. Yeah, it charges It charges faster. Um, it gets software updates basically as fast as doesn't Google's have phones. Wireless it's charging, though, doesn't it doesn't have wireless charging. That is a bit of a bummer. Um, but I, I think you're dead on with that. The 7T is an outstanding value. I mean, people have been laughing at OnePlus the last few years in terms of like, oh, well, OnePlus started at, you know, $300 and now they're selling for twice that. It's like, well, now phones have gotten more expensive and OnePlus is still a crazy value compared to the high-end phones out there. And really, they really just keep getting closer and closer to those much more expensive phones with each passing year. And I'm saying like, also, if you don't know much about 
you know, the product as we're going to talk about the whole experience of the product. If you've never really used a Pixel phone before and you're just used to, you know, the average Android phone out there, like not even average, like a nice Android phone, like say uh, a, a Moto a Moto or something, like the phones that are not too cruddy in terms of their user experience. And you look at this phone, you're about to upgrade and you look at this thing versus right next to a 7T, right? Look at, just look at the display, that forehead, that chin versus, you know, a tiny little teardrop notch. Like, Again, I just don't understand how they can price this thing and make it look the way it does and give it the specs it has. It's like you totally miss the boat by like a few miles. You can't even see the dock from your boat, okay? I'm not with you on the aesthetic part of it. I think the aesthetic is divisive because we're picky phone people. And I, I like the back really of matters. the phone. I think the back of the phone is amazing. They gave it me, is. by the way, they gave me the Coral and XL size and I love it. I love that Coral. Yeah, I, I love the white one. I've got the white one. I always like the Panda phones. And that's why I was talking with one of the product leads on Pixel at the event. I always forget his name, but um, it's a uh, it's I always like the black and white aesthetic on Google phones. I think it works really well. And I love the cases they make for them, too. Google makes good products. That's the thing. Through all this, it sounds like we're really dishing on Google's phones. But the fact is, they're outstanding to use. They're really nice. They take amazing photos. They're really fast. They get updates very frequently and for a very long time. If I was going to suggest a Android phone, if, an, if a family member of mine was like, I'm dead set on buying an Android phone, you know, to me, it's either Pixel or OnePlus. That's where I would send anybody. Basically, that's one. true. Absolutely. Yep. I might send them to Galaxy as well because I, you have to say, the Note particularly, Daniel Bader and I talked about this yesterday again. It's like they've been using a Note, he's been using a Note 10 for like the small one for a bit. And the screen real estate on that phone, the industrial design of that phone, I think it's brilliant. I, I just feel like it's big. I don't want it necessarily to be in my every day, but when I pick it up, my Plus, I have a Plus, it's like, wow, I can put so much stuff on this phone in, in my face, right? It's just like, a sea of screen and it feels like the future in your hand right um and i don't think this phone feels like the future in your hand this phone feels like a different future in your hand this phone feels feels like an experienced future um and that's i think that's what we should talk about next maybe yeah so i mean in terms of like what is google doing to advance the frontier of smartphones and i think they are doing some things i mean you saw mark whose last name i always forget get up there and talk about everything they're doing with the camera and when you watch all that stuff you're like whoa mark lavoy is it i think it's lavoy yeah. um and he's a really engaging guy to talk to he's also he, very sassy he's <laughs> super awesome he's a professor at stanford and you can tell he's been teaching for 30 years because I, I mean he's such an engaging every time he's on stage i just want to just like I, stop I know I listen intensely it's amazing i want to go to his ted talk like right, i want to hear right. this guy talk about computational photography for like an hour but what his team is doing is just like i mean you saw the super zoom samples the astrophotography samples and google doesn't really gussy up photo samples i think of the way apple tends to mm -hmm. where you know they're really going apple really goes for composition and you know perspective and everything google is just like this is physically what it's capable of and that's how they've usually tried to wow people and I think it's been very successful in that sense. And I'm not allowed to talk in depth about how the Pixel 4's camera is other than from the main camera. And I can say that, yep, definite improvement over the Pixel 3 without beyond shadow of a doubt. And I talked to Mark a lot about some of the changes they've been making and things like the dual contrast uh, exposure slider. Great, amazing feature. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The new HDR stuff is just really exciting to me. And I think also new portrait. I mean, there's no doubt that any Pixel you can take from the last two years uh, the two N series and the three series take amazing portraits, and I don't even maybe even the original Pixel. I don't know how, what the software updates did to it, but the point is that it was great, and now it's even better. I think. Yeah, and I think with the addition of the telephoto lens, I'm I'm probably going to be at the point where I say, no, nah, I think Google's taken the photography crown back away from Huawei again because they have a from level Apple, of. I, I um, think do uh, think, no, wait, I don't think so. Using the 11 Pro Max, I have not been very impressed, honestly, with the really? cameras. A lot of people are, and I've tried it, and I feel like it's very, very solid. I think Night Sight was de dethroned by Apple for a little while, but I have a feeling, and I don't know, I haven't tested yet, So, and also we're not allowed to talk about it anyway, but I have a feeling, and my bet is my gut tells me that this new Night Sight of theirs, that astrophotography Night Sight, is going to kick the iPhone back to in its place. So I think the thing that I've been talking to more and more people about is regarding the iPhone is that the still image quality on the 11 Pro is basically just where they were at with the iPhone 10. It's in two years progressed very little. So 
the thing where I have seen improvement is in Apple's Deep Fusion, which isn't available yet for the public. It's but only the low beta. light is way better than the iPhone 10. I have an iPhone 10 and low light. Oh yeah, definitely. Like the low light is like night and day difference. It's completely different. Um, but I think in terms of just general still imaging performance, I want to see what happens with Deep Fusion. I don't know if I'm going to have the iPhone long enough to try out Deep Fusion, but the results I've seen from that, like in terms of zoom performance, are pretty incredible. Like I've seen a lot of samples. I think they look really great. I think with the Pixel though. Google's thing with the dual exposure, like the continued like live HDR view in the viewfinder, that's amazing. Love it. Um, granted, Finally. they're not the first to do it. It took them forever. <laughs> I mean, but Samsung did it, what, three years ago or something? It's been a while, yeah. yeah. Samsung's had a long time. And then I think you've got other things like, um, you know, like I said, the, the new super zoom mode, I think, is going to impress people a lot. I think it's going to work really well. I think that in terms of camera performance, so far, I felt that it's very fast. Um, and I think just in terms of Google is very thoughtful about the camera in a way that I think a lot of companies really aren't very. So I was having a conversation with Mark and Dieter and Neelay from The Verge, and we were talking about a little bit about how Samsung and Huawei, when they talk about how they process their photos, they're doing it to a market. They want to process photos in a way that people in Asia basically want photos to look. Right. And. And our response, you know, here in the West is usually they look overprocessed, like people's faces look blurry um, to the point like it's like the makeup mode is applied to everything in the universe. And, you know, colors are totally unrealistic. <laughs> Everything's super punched out. You know, everybody knows that Samsung look to photos, um, whereas Google has taken a much more measured approach to processing. Now, that's not to say Google's photos always look realistic out of the pixels. But I think this year, the main camera images that I posted a sample gallery on our on our site. Um, Mark was telling me this year they went for a softer, less punchy approach to the HDR+. Plus. They wanted something that was a little less aggressive. That's simplifying. They actually base their look on, they have an, they have an artist they choose every year, I guess, to, to inspire their HDR plus look. And this year should be a little more balanced, a little pulled back, um, which I would appreciate because Google's pixel shots can look a little like uncanny valley sometimes where it's yeah. like <laughs> they have, it's like this, the world doesn't quite look like that, does it? I'm not sure. I don't remember. <laughs> so I, I think the camera is going to be like industry leading. I also think that compared to the iPhone 11 Pro Max, most consumers won't be able to tell the difference. <laughs> yeah, and that, right. That's a I mean, I'm super excited about taking this for a spin in terms of imaging. I, I am, going, you know, that's part one of the main reasons I have a Pixel in my pocket is because I'm a huge mobile photography fan and I take a ton of photos and I've been doing that since 2005. I actually learned to take photos on a phone before I graduated to real cameras. Um, so that's how I started. And so to me, it's kind of a root essential part of my phone experience, which is also why I have a pixel in my pocket every day. It's that, the Google experience, the Google universe, the Google ecosystem for me, it is also the updates and the new OS every year. Uh, and of course the imaging, those are the reasons. And but it's definitely not the RAM and definitely not the base storage and definitely not the price and definitely not the lack of ultra wide. That's, yeah, and I, yeah. I and so I guess let's let's end our discussion the Pixel Four with this question. I want to know the customer Google is building this phone for. I have no idea. Like this is what I'm trying to figure out. Yeah, I get the I, product. Like I I I see the the genius of the whole you know Google Assistant integration that new recorder that transcribes in real time, you know offline and lets you search your notes. It's been done before, but. It looks like it's never been done like this before. And this is where Google comes in. It's like that computational photography, it's all because of machine learning and because they have the data sizes to back up that machine learning. Those, those models are fed by the biggest data sets in the world. Same with voice, uh, voice recognition. So that's where Google shines and they keep this reserved for the pixel every year. Like they always get that stuff on there first. Like the new Google Assistant is only on the four, right? Yeah. So I think that's that's a good point to bring up, especially I would say Google builds every year the smartest phone. It is the Definitely. It puts the smart in smartphone in a way that I think a lot of other phones don't. There are a lot of thoughtful things and not say everything Google does to make them smarter works the first try. Um, there have been a lot of things that have just not worked out very well. Um, for example, the new uh, live caption feature, which is legitimately amazing. It's basically closed caption for your phone in real time. Anytime you're playing something, it plays captions of it. Any media source, it's going to caption it for you, which if you're a person who has um, a hearing disability of some kind is amazing, but it's also just amazing for everybody because half the time I'm watching videos, I'm not really paying close attention maybe to the audio. I get a live caption of whatever the narrator is saying, which is helpful to me. I think everybody likes that now and again. That said, when I went to use it for the first time, it 
drain the battery at a remarkable rate because I accidentally left a YouTube video pause in the background. And I guess live caption never stopped running. You have to turn it off mm. if you want it to stop listening. And so it drains a lot of battery. So it's a very smart feature, but one that if you're not careful in the way you use it, may drain your battery and cause your phone experience to be absolutely terrible because your phone is dead halfway through the day because you forgot to turn it off. It's these <laughs> these things that sometimes you're like, Google, like this is something that a regular person using their phone is going to like be baffled by and probably never quite understand like what's causing their issue. There's an ongoing notification about it, but a lot of people don't check their notifications. So, but it speaks to, like I said, the, the question of who's the phone for? Has Google at any point demonstrated that its phones are, I mean this literally, smarter enough <laughs> to be worthwhile, like for consumers to be worth paying attention to on, uh, you know, in their own right? And I think the answer is no. Yeah, no, I feel like it's a very narrow band of an, op of, a, of an audience that they're targeting. I know they're trying to steal the iPhone audience, the Apple audience, it's not gonna happen. I don't think, again, like until, once you have an Apple Watch on your wrist and you're using iMessage, you're, you're screwed. That's it, you're done. You're never going back. And that's why I don't use iMessage because I know that if I start, I'm not gonna go back. And that's sad, but you know, uh, <clears throat> I message for Android Apple, right? I mean, it needs to happen. I, I think it really needs to happen. I know it's not going to, but it needs to happen. Um, the Apple Watch is an incredible product. I worked for, for Pebble in the early days when the company was successful. I was the head of communications there. And I joined the company primarily because I felt that, you know, smartwatches were interesting and they were doing a very good job with that. And so I know a thing or two about smartwatches. And if I have to recommend a smartwatch to anybody today, it's going to be an Apple watch. And unfortunately, that means that a lot of people can't use it because it doesn't work with Android. And that's just the reality. So I don't know what this phone is for. I, I, I This phone is for me and it's, I'm going to begrudgingly use it and continue making like, like I keep joking about this on my podcast that I have Stockholm syndrome with the I, the pixel, right? Because it's like, I've, I've learned to love my captors or something and they treat me somewhat well. So I'm going to stick around because it's just like, I feel so frustrated half the time, but at the same time, so delighted half the time. And I can't really find that balance that I wish where things were a little less extreme, like at least the six gigs of RAM should help because my Pixel Three XL continuously kills apps in the background for me. Yeah, that's that's an issue. That's Definitely a big issue. Really I'd have be that frustrated for me, and it's the lag on that phone. The lag after you use a One Plus Seven T, it's just like every time I tap something in interface, and I think it hasn't happened. I tap it again, and then it happens as I'm tapping it again, and then it brings me to another part of the UI, and I just want to throw the phone against the wall. And it happens multiple times a day. Why can't phones keep up with what I'm doing on them? The only phone that so far that I've used that can keep up with my crazy Gmail use is a 70. No other phone in the universe has kept up with my fingers. Yeah. So um, let's shift gears a little bit here and talk about a couple of other items that happened at the event. And when I said, you know, Google doesn't have an ecosystem, Google would, of course, beg to differ. <laughs> um, I think the first part of that ecosystem that we should probably go into, I'm going to switch up the order of our show here a little bit, is the Pixel Book Go. Mm -hmm. Because I think that was probably a product that Google had a real chance to try and make a splash with and devoted an entire 40 seconds of its presentation to which just like kind of blew my mind. I was like, really? That's that's all we're saying about this? Like, it just feels like they're, are they, like, my question when that happened on stage was, are there like sunsetting Chromebooks? Like, this is what it feels like. This is like, oh, we're just gonna make a cheaper Pixel book and, you know, let's move on now. And I'm just like, wait, wait a minute. Pixel book user here, you're a Pixel book user too, David. Yes. It's like, uh, no, 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 no. You do not understand. I love my Pixel Book. I've been using it for two years. The battery is phenomenal. Uh, everything about it is amazing except the bezels and the display could be brighter. That's it. Give me a new Intel chip, a better display with brighter, with a brighter, less bezel-y display, and that's what I wanted. And you still haven't made this. We told you to do this last year, Google, when you made that stupid slate, and instead you bring out a overpriced, in my opinion, for what it is, Chromebook with a 69 display that's not bright enough. Like it was so dim. I know we were in a very bright environment, but it was so dim I was disappointed. Look, it looks great. It feels nice. The keyboard's amazing. The trackpad is fantastic. But 649 for that thing? And that's the base price for what a core i3 or something? And at 69, 69, David. 
Yeah, that's the part that really makes me feel betrayed. <laughs> Switching to the 16. So I talked to one of the product managers on the uh, Pixel uh, Pixelbook Go, and his reasoning for basically everything was, well, it's cheaper. <laughs> and so why is the display 16.9? Well, 16.9 displays are much cheaper because there are many more of them are produced yeah. um, versus the weirdo 3.2 display that the Pixelbook uses. Why isn't it convertible? Well, because it's much cheaper to make a traditional laptop. Um, why is the screen not as nice looking? Well, it's cheaper, which it is not as nice looking. The in-panel the reflection, resolution on that, by the it's way? It's 1080p, so um, another downgrade. Oh. And so you, if you want the 4K molecular display, um, that is the only available on the $1,400 model um, with the i7. That yeah. thing goes up to $1,400? Are you fucking kidding me, David? Oh, yeah, it's ridiculous. It's I mean, completely you, insane. you better off buying a two-year-old pixel book that you can find used or new even like in the box from some overstock somewhere than buying that thing at that point of course like, i absolutely a agree times yeah 100 percent there with you on that i think that the pixel book is just a better product the only thing that i think the pixel book go improved on there were two things that i think were noteworthy number one the keyboard is a little different um it's definitely more tactile i don't know if i like that i think everybody else who tried it liked it um, I was a little more like I'd have to use it to, if I wanted to know, but it seems like mostly an improvement. It the didn't other, put me off. Yeah, the other improvement, and this one would not be evident to anybody, the battery is a lot easier to replace. So there are two screws on the bottom and then two screws under the feet. You pull that out. The battery is right there. There's a, a glue strip. You pull it. Battery's out. Like, so it's super easy to replace the battery out, like user replaceable, which wow. is awesome. The Pixel Book was a fairly difficult repair job to repair the to replace the battery and mine is getting to the point where you know the battery uh, you know might be replaceable here soon i'm right. not going to keep using it but yeah you know, that would be a concern of mine the other yeah. problem is what what's new with chrome os on this new laptop and the answer seems to be nothing nothing you bring out a new laptop what else does it do is there anything else new that it does nope just, just i mean look, i think I think that here's my thoughts on this. It should top off at 999 fully loaded. Um, maybe without a 4K display, but give us a 1440 display, you know, that's 2K. Uh, that's, th you know, if that thing had been 3.2, 1440 uh, with a Core i7 for 999 or even 1199, I would have said, okay, I get it. Um, and it's st it would have started at like 599 or 499 for the i3 with little RAM and, and, you know, maybe you have a 1080p display at that point. But it's just, you know, there are so many good Chromebooks out there from Acer, Asus, Dell, others. I have this rugged Chromebook I took to Burning Man from Dell. It costs $419. And honestly, I don't think you need anything more than that. The keyboard's great. The trackpad's great. The display's just as crappy as the Chromebook Go, uh, the Pixelbook Go. And it's great battery life, insanely long. And uh, on top of that, it's a rugged. It's a two-in-one, and it's ruggedized. Like you can literally throw this thing around all day long; nothing bad is going to happen to it. So four nineteen. Yeah, there, and that's the whole thing. The Chromebook market is all about price. It is one hundred percent about the money. You know, nobody's buying you know super expensive Chromebooks. I don't get me wrong. I love the Pixelbook. I think that Google overpriced it at the start. I think the sales have made it much more palatable. I don't think many people are buying them, but no. I think that that's kind of the problem here what's the market for an expensive Chromebook? Well, there isn't one. It doesn't exist. Those people, we are basically non, like there's non- a, There's an audience of five. Like, I mean, the thing is, the, the thing is, well, it's a Halo product. And that's the thing, like even the Pixel laptop before it, the two Jordan generations that I used are like, you show them to people and people are like, wow, holy crap, this is a beautiful laptop, yes. right? And and that's exactly the point. It's like not everybody buys a Lamborghini, right? But a lot of people like Volkswagen Golfs, right? Same company, right? Volkswagen Group, okay? So the point is, or better comparison, probably an Audi R8. But the point is, and then they go buy an Audi A3. But the thing is, like, this is the reality that I think Halo devices are real and should exist, but they should never be profit margin device. Like, I mean, they should yeah. be profit margin device. They should never be devices that you count on to make money. So I like that that Google went out and made these crazy expensive pixels that were no compromise. But this thing feels like still too expensive and compromised. And what the F? Like, why? Like when the entire ecosystem is making such better products, you fail again, Google. 
Yeah, and I think uh, a person I've ta heard talk about this extensively is Kevin Tofel over at About Chromebooks. Oh, yeah. And his his whole thing has been, he was really hoping that Google was going to make a developer-focused Chromebook, a Chromebook that was powerful enough oh, for developers yeah. to do development on, because it does, it has Linux now. And eventually, hopefully, Google will release a version of the Android development environment for Chromebooks, compiled for Chrome OS. It hasn't happened. Um, I think it's still on is it in beta, I think? But anyway, you know, the idea there, though, being that developers need more than an ultra low power CPU. They need a mid tier mobile CPU, which is the right. Intel U series usually, um, which is what Microsoft's new Surface laptop has. And so uh, the idea. The Surface laptop. Yes, of course. That's the one you want. I bought it. Um, I bought the Surface laptop. It's coming next week. Um, so I'm very excited for it. But uh, I think that. Kevin pointed out a really good, like, point out saying really important. Like, if you're going to build this laptop, A, first start with a laptop that works for your own employees. Google has tons of employees. A ton of them are developers. There's basically no good Chromebook out there for development right now. They could they build all a, use Macs. Yeah, Everybody they, that I know that works at Google as a developer uses some sort of MacBook or MacBook Pro. Of course, because it's the best product for what they do, without a doubt. The Mac is like the preferred development environment these days. Google has a chance to say, all right, if you work on Android stuff or if you work on our other platforms, you know, we can build you a Chromebook that's just as powerful as your Mac. And we can build you, like, we can work on building software for that. You can work on building software for that, like, to make your own development environment, something that you could be proud of. And Google seems totally uninterested in that. And I don't understand why. That would be a pixel book I might be interested in, too. Me um, too, especially yeah. Because I think that could get the ball rolling on making Chrome OS more powerful and more versatile, which is something it really hasn't become in the last it few years. Chrome be, OS is it could make Chromebook the Linux that we've always wanted on our laptop. Yeah, exactly. I think that if you had Googlers who were passionate about using Chrome OS, more of them that is, you would probably see a Chrome OS that does and is capable of a lot more than the one right now, which is essentially the Chrome OS we've always had, but with virtual desktops and Android apps. And that's not enough to keep me on the platform anymore. It's just, it's not enough. I feel so like hamstrung doing certain workflows on Chrome OS, local media management. Oh my God. Something so basic, I know. something so simple, yeah. but because of the way they've sandboxed Android apps away from the regular file system, good luck getting an Android app to load a local file from your Chromebook. It's not clear how to do it. The system provides next to no guidance. A regular person would not ever figure this out. And for me, sometimes apps just randomly won't get the, won't get access to the files for whatever reason. I don't know. So I think that Google really dropped the ball there. I think the Pixel would go like any high-end Chromebook, like you said, there's no real audience. But as a Halo product, the Pixel Book Go is a big letdown. There's nothing Halo well, about it. I don't think it ever meant, that's the thing, it was never meant to be a, a, a Halo product because it's too expensive and doesn't have the right specs to ever be, uh, too expensive for its specs. And it should be more expensive with better specs if you wanted to be a Halo product. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, I mean, look, I'm not against this Pixel Book Go. I want to get a review unit. In fact, I pinged Google for one because they didn't give me one automatically like some people did get one, I believe. Uh, but the thing is, it's like, I will try it. But I know right now that it'll be hard for me to recommend to the people that normally buy Chromebooks because of the price. And it's going to be hard to recommend to people like us who are willing to spend money on a Halo Chromebook because it doesn't meet those spec requirements. It's kind of in this weird uncanny valley of in between being, you know, under spec but overpriced and it's just weird. And so basically it's like at this point, I'm just going to cling hard to my Pixel Book uh, original best I can. And then I'm going to, you know, continue using my MacBook and uh, probably get a Surface Laptop 3 because I have the original Surface Laptop 1 and it was great except for the lack of USB-C. My entire world is USB-C, so I need that. And now they finally fixed that problem and I love that hardware. I loved it so hard. Which color did you get? Did you get one with the Alcantara? Because I hate that. No, I got the new, uh, uh, like sand color one that, that uh, everybody was raving about. Alcantara. Yeah, it's all metal. Um, I did That's not the want the Alcantara. Now, the Alcantara looks great for a little while. Mine is still looking good because I haven't used the laptop much, right? Like I just, it's a review unit. But uh, it's going to, you know what it looks like in cars. You and I both yes. know what it looks like. Yeah, it's terrible. I, I don't if it's know. a surface you touch, if it's like the, the headline or surfaces you don't touch often, it's fine. But if it's a surface you touch often, oof. Bad, 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 bad. Yeah, it's not good stuff. So uh, some people in the chat want to know, do we think a dual boot Chrome OS is a good idea? A laptop that can run Chrome OS and can run Windows. And, you know, 
I would say yes, please just give it. I honestly, at this point, I am in that camp where I would just rather have the dual boot. That way I can boot up Windows, run Photoshop or Lightroom when I need to, which is not very often, but frequently enough that like it makes my pixel book much less versatile than it should be. Or premiere and then, if you're editing video. Yeah, exactly. Just, you know, be able to run these applications that obviously Chrome OS is just never going to get. Google is in a state of denial about that. Um, the other the issue you run into there is, you know, local storage on Chromebooks is generally pretty pathetic. Yeah. And I don't know how robust external storage is for those kinds of workflows. I'm not sure how well it really works on Chromebooks. But I at this point, yes, I would rather have that on my Pixelbook. I would give up half of my storage to put a Windows install on there, boot up Lightroom when I need it, import my photos, do all that work in there dump it to an external drive, pull those photos up in Chrome OS for my publishing workflow and do things that way. It would just be so much easier than trying to do the square peg into the round hole that is media on Chrome OS. And I mean, come on, Macs can be rebooted into Windows. They've been supporting that forever. So why couldn't Chromebooks do that? Because Google's against it. They don't want to do it. They've made it a... Uh, condition of being a partner um, for Google Apps distribution that you can't make these dual boot devices. Asus tried to make a, um, a laptop that ran Chrome and uh, Windows, and Google said no. They shut, or it was Acer, and they shut it down, and they wow. shut the project down. So, yeah, they were like, we're pulling, we'll pull your Chrome license. Um, <laughs> so, it was, uh, it was not a good situation. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I just I I'm I'm done with Chrome OS for the time being. Honestly, it might be my at home laptop, but my work laptop for the future is going back to Windows. Yeah, I mean, I want I want folks to know, and you know, I'm not I'm not trying to be negative about. I'm, I'm a big fan of Google. I'm a big fan of Chromebooks. I'm I was one of the first people. I was working at Engadget when the original Chromebook came out, and. I just I was one of the big proponents, one of the people who really supported, wrote great stories about it, really told people this is the future, this is the way to go. And you know, it hasn't really evolved that much. It's still very solid for many things if you just work on the web a lot. But it's just like, you know, we're being hypercritical of Google here because we both are heavily involved in that ecosystem and live in it and use it every day. Like you look at my iPhone, it's all Google apps. I don't use, basically the only thing I use that's that's from Apple is my phone backup feature, that's it. And I don't even back up my photos to Apple servers. I back up my photos to Google Photos on the iPhone. So basically, and I think there's a lot, I know a lot of Googlers who use iPhones exactly the same way. It's all Google apps and they use the backup feature from Apple in case their phone gets stolen. That's it. So, you know, this is, this is why we're critical. This is why we're pissy about this stuff. It's like, it seems like Google is living in a vacuum and doesn't seem to be aware of what's happening around them and keeps making these weird boneheaded decisions. It's like, can you finally just do the right thing, Google? It's not hard. Just hire people like us to tell you what to do. Yeah, so this actually goes into a question from a couple of our readers. Um, so Badger asks, um, as tech reporters, do you express your dissatisfaction to Google? And I can speak for myself in saying, absolutely. Well, yeah. Like, I mean, I, I mean, we're pretty open right now on the podcast. They're going to listen to it, hopefully. And then, you know, we're pretty open about it in, in Twitter and on public. And I've talked to them in person about my concerns, uh, especially when I had more clout, when I was a journalist that had more, uh, you know, basically more readership than I do now. And, and you know, it's like I don't think it ever goes anywhere. I don't. It's like the same with so many companies. They just don't listen. Yeah, I don't think they do always listen. And you know what? So the thing is about feedback, you have to, you pick your battles as a journalist. You cannot go in guns blazing to every press conference and every situation and briefing and be like, here are the 80 things I think that are wrong about your strategy right now. And that's how you just get yourself kicked off the list. Honestly, we as journalists do have to look at that and say, well, you know, um, what is a good for my publication and B what is also like the appropriate level of feedback to provide in these situations where, you know, you're letting them know, giving them a warning, like, Hey, I'm going to be talking about this. This is something we're going to be discussing on, you know, our outlet. So we do talk about those things. There are other situations. Like I got on my plane yesterday. I was like on a standby flight. I walked up in the first row of the plane. Guess who's sitting there? It's Rick Osterlo. <laughs> and I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> I was like, hey, Mr. Osterlo, great presentation today. Thanks for having us out. And that's when the situation is like, yes, I could tell Rick Osterlo everything that's wrong with the pixel yeah. business. I'm not going to do that. You don't want to be a dick to people. That's not only that, but it's not the right setting, right? They're it's not, tired. Of they're trying to fly home. They, they're done with their business. You know, you don't want to like jump on them at that time. 
Yeah, of course. And so, yes, we do express our concerns and a lot of questions. I, I am very skeptical of Google. Like, uh, they, I, I go into Google briefings and honestly get a lot of looks of like, oh, why are you asking about that? That's, uh, well, that's just the way we chose to do it. That's the answer to a lot of questions I get. And so, yes, I ask a lot of questions that Google probably doesn't love answering and that I don't get very good answers about. Do I think Google changes its business practices or product development based on what I say? Probably not. Um, honestly, they're just not, most of these companies just aren't receptive in that, in that context. They're not looking for help. They're looking to gauge what their PR response is going to be to what you write. I know, but I think that, you know, they do, I mean, big companies, to be clear, big companies do eventually listen to the general kind of yes zeitgeist of the media and also consumers, right? I mean, that's the other thing, you, you know, we're journalists, we're, it's a bit of a weird world we live in, but you as consumers who are thinking like right, right now we're listening to the show trying to figure out if you're going to spend your hard-earned cash on a pixel 4 or 4xl or a pixel book go you know it's a you, you have a say too right like you should go out there and tell people what you think um tell you know people do those surveys when people send them to you because even though they might not go anywhere maybe maybe it's just lip service for them trying to look like they care it's always important to voice your opinion about stuff and you know maybe you'll become a journalist because of it because basically being a journalist is basically being full of opinions yeah and uh doing the words good and you know <laughs> but um Anyway, let me do a real quick plug for our podcast here. That is our ad this week. Um, if you like what you're hearing in this podcast, it's actually being broadcast live on Twitch right now as we're recording it. And you can join us um, three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, even though we're here on Thursday because we have Miriam on and that was a good day for everybody. But we're on like four days a week now and it's on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Android, please. You can join us live. And if you subscribe on Twitch, um, you can join us in our chat room and ask us questions and we will try to answer them for you on the show, at least the ones we think are worth answering and uh yeah so if you're an amazon prime subscriber you can subscribe to our channel on twitch for free and you help support the show when you do that subscriptions are really important to us and you know they're a reason we can keep doing this podcast so again that's twitch.tv slash android please and those of you who have been subscribing for a long time some of you are up to like 13 months or something like that thank you so much for supporting it uh, supporting us and the show it really does help a lot um with that let's shift directions a little bit and talk, mm -hmm. um, Miriam. What what are you up to lately, aside from you know Google and uh, what's you know what kind of exciting products have you been looking at recently? Uh, it's uh, Tech Toba Phone Apocalypse right now. Things are yeah. a little rough uh, around the edges. I'm so behind on so much stuff. It's uh, it's bad. Like I mean, I unboxed my freaking Pixel Four this morning, like two days late. Um, anyway, um, I mean, I got nine phones since I got back from Burning Man to play with. Uh, some of them are important, some of them are not, uh, or at least just interesting. Uh, you know, I, the, the two things that have kind of stood out, and I know I wrote this story for you folks uh, at Android Police about that, uh, that rugged Yuli phone, uh, from, uh, from China that I used at Burning Man. That was kind of fun. Um, and then, uh, I've been, uh, I'm, I'm going to write a story for you guys. I'm, I'm kind of compiling my notes right now. It's a lot of trial and error of trying to figure things out. I have an Honor 9X Pro from uh, from people at Honor slash Huawei. And that phone is one of the first that didn't come with GMS out of the factory. So it doesn't have Google mobile services. So um, yes, you can buy it on Ali, uh, you know, AliExpress or whatever. Uh, and they've opened the box and they've installed GMS on it, the, the people who sell it, uh, probably from that LZ Play uh, workaround that existed for a while. Uh, they probably still have access to the the code for that, the the whatever the the workaround was. Um, so they put that on your phone and then they ship it to you and you get an on a 9x Pro with GMS. Except that you can't factory reset it, right? So it's a little rough around the edges. Uh, so what I'm trying to do for this article is figure out what is life like if you were to get a phone like this, a phone that came from China that doesn't have GMS, doesn't support GMS, cannot work with GMS, like a Mate 30 Pro or this Honor 9X Pro. What do you do? How does it, how is life with that? And I can, I'm not going to spoil it for you completely because I think you, the journey is more interesting than the destination here. The destination is that you're kind of fucked. Okay. It's not going to happen. This is a complete shit show. You shouldn't do it. But the journey is really interesting because I've had to try to find substitute apps for everything and I have somewhat succeeded, but clearly not enough to make it 
uh, this thing a success and I would not recommend it to anyone in the end. So that's kind of one of the things I've been working on. Uh, the other thing that's fun, I don't know if you've played with this phone, David, the Nubia Z20. Our guy Scott in the UK has one. I've seen it. It seems like just a gimmick to me, quite honestly. Um, what I like about this phone, honestly, is that it has a clean build of Android. Um, whether it gets updates or not is a whole off a different story. But it has a clean build of Android. The hardware is really solid, really well made. Everything's good. Everything works. The camera is surprisingly decent. Um, and it's got a Snapdragon 55 Plus and 8 gigs of RAM and 120 gigs of storage for 549 US dollars. And it's sold officially by Nubia in the US. 549 for those specs. And as a bonus, you get this really crazy thing where there's no front facing camera, but you can use the rear camera uh, to take selfies because there's an additional 5.1 inch 720p OLED display in the back. In addition to the 6.4 inch 1080p OLED display in the front. And there's some cool things like um, there's two fingerprint sensors, one on each side. So if you uh, unlock with the phone facing up, regarding which sensor you use, it automatically turns on the front screen. And if you flip the phone, you lock it again, you flip the phone, you unlock it, it's the rear screen. It, so it knows kind of like you can manually force the screens. When you take a photo of someone, you can tell it to show their face on the viewfinder in the back so that they can see the shot you're composing and say, oh, no, no, uh, wait, my hair doesn't look quite right. So, you know, it's interesting. And and I wouldn't care if it was a thousand dollar phone, but at five hundred forty nine, even those specs alone are kind of interesting to me. Yeah, I mean, I, I find them interesting as kind of like a sector to observe. I'm just not honestly, I'm just not interested in using them anymore. It's been it's been years since I've really given a lot of the cheaper phones a shot, and there's so much exciting stuff happening at the high end now that I'm just kind of like, well, I'd I'd rather be living with. But that. it is high end, eight fifty five plus. Like, I mean, this is yeah. a flagship great phone. It's it's compromised in a number of ways. Num number one being that Nubia made it, and I don't really want to use anything they've made. Like I just right. don't want to don't want to deal with it. I would never want to live with a phone that that company, which has produced some remarkably buggy software over the years, like yeah. impressively so. Um, don't really want anything to do with that. Um, but I hear uh, you. But I mean, it exists, and it's up there with uh, you know, in some ways, it's up there with the one one plus seven T. It's up there with as low as the uh, four hundred dollar uh, K twenty Pro from Redmi, aka the Mi nine T Pro. I mean, it is a phone that exists in that realm of affordable flagships, along with the ZT Axon ten Pro, which is another phone that I reviewed for Geekspin. Um, along with the Asus Zenfone 6, along with a bunch of other, you know, Snapdragon 855 or 855 Plus equipped phones. The other one that I've been playing with that I really like is a Snapdragon 730G based phone, which is the Oppo Reno 2. And the cameras on this thing kind of are really impressing me for the money. Yeah, so I, I like what, you know, Oppo is a company that to me is very skilled from an engineering standpoint and building to a price point, obviously. Um, I think that they they have a lot of interesting ideas and they're willing to take risks. Um, and also their interest in photography is interesting to me. I like, I, they genuinely seem to want to make phones that take better photos than a lot yeah. of the Chinese competition, which generally has been pretty not great um, at that side of making phones. I mean, this is a phone that doesn't sell in the U.S. officially, unlike the others I mentioned, and it's uh, probably about six hundred dollars for a Snapdragon seven thirty. If you were to import it for a seven thirty G, which is a little expensive, when you can get an eight fifty five for that money, is if spec matters to you, of course. But the industrial design, the design, the look, the feel, the materials are super top notch, super high end, and the uh, cameras pretty damn great. The thing that lets this phone down that I don't, really just can't recommend it, obviously it's an import, so you have to deal with like warranties and whatever, but also it, the software, I mean, it's, yeah. you know, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's much better than some of the older Oppo phones I've used, but honestly, you, you know, you have to put another launcher and another keyboard for sure on this phone. And even then, will you get updates? Meh, who knows? And, uh, you know, it's still extremely contaminated. Like the, the you know, the, 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 the what's it called? The system setting, the settings uh, interface is completely weird. And, and the, 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 the pull down tray and everything, the notifications and shortcuts, yes. all that is broken as hell. Yep. So that's the problem with these Chinese phones. The reason I cover these, uh, David, is... Uh, first of all, uh, and I find them interesting. But secondly, uh, my audience is pretty much split between, like if you look at the large majority of my listeners, they come from US, UK, and then India. 
And as you know, a lot of the Chinese phones end up in India. So they kind of like me to try to get my hands on as many as they can. Um, and then what else is going on? I don't know. I'm, I'm looking forward to what else they throw at us next. It seems like this year they've kind of shifted this Techtober phone apocalypse to start more in September and end in October than to start in October and end in November like last yeah. year. So I think we are we just have to soldier on. I think um, so. I think we're, yeah. we're finally done with all of the crazy phone announcements for the year. I mean, I think it's possible we'll see that that Motorola phone come out before the end of the year. You know, I which heard one some, specifically? The the oh, Razor, the folding one. Oh yeah, yeah. So we'll I see if that know. happens. I'm, I'm also feeling, we'll see. <laughs> I have a feeling that with everyone that's making a folding phone right now, it's put it's kind of put it on ice because of what happened with Samsung. And I have to give Samsung kudos for following through despite you know. Uh, the fact that this product is going to be a very delicate machine to buy for $2,000. Uh, yeah. You know, but it needs to happen. This folding thing needs to happen somehow. We need to figure it out as a technology because there's some validity to it. Once you've used a fold for a bit, it's like, wow, this is interesting. This is, this is uh, I could see myself doing this. But then you're like, so many compromises and broke. It's kind of like that. You know, as you said, that Nubia, right? It's like on paper is a great phone. I've used it; it's a great phone. But like updates and bugginess and la la la, and then you kind of go, like, nah. You throw your hands up in the air and you go, yeah. forget it. I'm going to buy one plus seventeen and call it a day, right? Yeah. So, so I guess uh, here's let's let's end with this question. Um, we are running a little long here, but I do want to ask this one because I had it planned beforehand. What do you think is going to be the big thing next year in phones, aside from folding? Let's let 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 folding be its own thing. Uh oof, that's a tough one. In dis under in and under display uh front facing camera sensors. Okay. So I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm it's curious not, it's one of this. many things. There's a few. There, that's one thing we're gonna see. We're also gonna see even less bezels. Um so China's gonna bring us I just wanna be clear, like China versus the West, because I mean I hate to put Google and Apple in and maybe Samsung because oh you know, they're Korean, put them in the West because they have the big majority of the Western market. I mean, Google doesn't, but Google by its ecosystem and its presence as a, uh, you know, uh, a platform has a lot of, of cloud. I think we're going to see a lot of innovation from China as usual. I think China is driving innovation. Uh, here's what I'm guessing is going to happen. Um, we're going to see a resolution of the whole Huawei Honor thing. Um, Hopefully. <laughs> I think so. I think so. And then we're going to see uh, under display in display whatever front facing cameras at first they're going to be kind of crappy second gen is going to be pretty decent it's going to be the same as the in display fingerprint sensors were we're going to see less bezels all around from the from the chinese uh wrap around displays that either wrap around the top like samsung has shown in their patents or wrap around the sides like the xiaomi mi max uh we're that's real that's gonna happen oppo vivo and xiaomi are going to be the front of all this stuff uh and huawei of course and then we're going to see uh, you know, in terms of like the the West, in terms of like the Apple and the um, and the Googles and the Samsungs, I think we're going to see a more of an iterative experience there. We're going to see uh, hopefully a better better experience in terms of of uh, OS integration. Like I think that uh, what's happening right now with Android, you know, it's it just feels like there's so much fragmentation. I'm hoping that Android 10 can kind of pull things together even more tightly in terms of experience for users. Um, but I'm not 100% convinced that's going to happen. Uh, other things, I mean, I don't think it's going to be a huge revelation. We're going to see better cameras, of course. Um, but I think the days of pop-ups and sh shark fins and things like that are going to be numbered. I think I think you're right about that. I don't know if it's next year that we'll see many of that. We'll definitely see a few. We've already seen a rumor from Ice Universe that um, there's going to be a Samsung phone next year with an under display front facing camera. It won't be an S or Note series phone. They though. always do or, that. Excuse they me, did, won't be an S or Fold. They yeah, did the they, A9 they, they did for it. the for yeah. the first uh, for the first multi camera phone before they even did more than two. Yeah. Samsung experiments and it's a series. It's you know a lot of the Southeast Asia popular phones um, that are they're 
fairly expensive actually but i you know i think next year we'll probably see um we'll probably see some more innovation you know definitely on cameras i think that i think that the big thing we're coming up against on smartphone cameras is sensor size and i think that we've seen some breakthroughs from samsung and sony with bigger sensors and this, this that came out this year yeah, yeah. not many manufacturers are utilizing them yet so i think we're going to see some significant upgrades um i'm hoping samsung will have a banner year for cameras next year it's long overdue yeah, they right. really need to upgrade yeah. the camera experience in a significant way i think we'll also my prediction we will see more chinese manufacturers selling phones in the united states next year i think oh it's i would be so happy with that especially if they can stick with a more stock android experience like a lot of them have like the axon 10 pro that from zt that nubia z20 they're pretty they're not skinning them they're just selling them as almost as a eos whatever uh you know um uh, products and it's kind of cool i'm predicting apple will drop the notch and add USB-C to their phone next year, uh, or the notch will be so thin, it'll just basically be a sliver at the top. Yeah. Um, and then definitely USB-C. And I'm predicting uh, that we're going to see a lot more 5G phones for better or for worse. We'll see about that. I think we'll see a ton of 5G phones outside the United States. That's I, what I'm saying. Yeah. Like I'm saying like we'll see 5G phones uh, at a price point that's lower and mostly non-millimeter, like sub six in markets like Europe, uh, where it's basically LT on steroids, right? And and I think maybe in the US, of course, and the, the you know, I don't think Apple do 5G yet, but and I don't think Pixel will do 5G either, but I think Samsung will continue doing 5G and be kind of like the forefront of the millimeter wave quote unquote non-revolution, because really it's just such a terrible like, yeah, and that that is a can of worms we could open and go on for another forty five minutes about, yeah. quite honestly. Um, but we are running a little long here, so um, thank you for listening to uh, thank you for listening to us, uh, everybody, this week. And feel free to connect with us anytime. Like I said, we're live four times a week on twitch.tv slash Android, please. Generally midday, midday Pacific, around noon is when we try to do our shows. Usually Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but sometimes not. We'll try to keep you updated with that on our social channels. You can follow us on Twitter at Android Police, um, and we'll definitely keep you updated there on our podcast plans uh all stories you talked about uh can be found on androidpolice.com slash podcast at our podcast landing page you can send your thoughts and suggestions and we're definitely looking for feedback on this new format um to podcast at androidpolice.com and miriam where can everybody find you you should all subscribe to my podcast at mobiletechpodcast.com but um you know a lot of people don't use rss feeds anymore for podcasts so i'm on google Podcasts, apple Podcasts, pocket cast overcast look for me on spotify as well if you use stitcher tune in radio i'm there too basically all the platforms please subscribe i can use your support um it's a weekly show it gets published late in the week weekend ish uh, and, uh, you know, I always have guests like David and others on the show, usually journalists, sometimes industry people, and it's all about mobile tech and includes, and includes cars because I feel like cars are mobile tech. You can step into these days. I have so it's much true. tech. Um, and so a lot of EV stuff, cause I'm a big EV advocate, uh, but also a car enthusiast like David. So there you go. Check it out. We like tangents too. Sometimes we talk about crazy stuff like Iceland. <laughs> <laughs> awesome so on twitter i'm rdrv3 our producer jules wang is at point jules and our theme music is by home we're off tomorrow uh, that's friday but join us on monday at noon pacific we'll have ryan witwam on with our old friend cameron summerson from reviewsgeek.com and uh, we're very much looking forward to that i'll be out the next couple of weeks unfortunately but uh ryan and the rest of the team will be great custodians of the show and um thank you for listening again everybody this week this episode will be live um on podcast networks everywhere probably uh tomorrow afternoon um that would be friday so uh look forward to seeing it then thanks again for being on miriam yeah thanks so much and just quickly my handle on twitter is tnkgrl tank girl without the definitely vowels. follow miriam thank you so much